Take your Bible. We're going to go in Philippians uh, one last time here as we come to the conclusion of this series we've been doing called Joyful. If you need a Bible, just wave at one of the ushers in the aisles and they'll be glad to let you borrow one and you can keep it if you need a Bible. And don't be afraid to use the table of contents. We'll go to Philippians chapter 4 is where we're going to be in just a moment. But while you're turning there, I need to tell you, <clears throat> I think there's quite a few of us here today who have a disease. And uh, the problem is the disease hadn't yet been diagnosed. So I feel sort of bad that I have to be the one to uh, bring it to you. But I think it's true. I'll describe some of the symptoms and you can see if you have any of this. Uh, one of the symptoms is men, grown, sound-minded men have been known with this disease to go into their garage, look at their car that is perfectly good, only two years old, and they say to themselves, I need a new car. Uh, women who have this disease, they've been known to go into their closets that are full of clothes, and they stare at all the clothes and they say, I have nothing to wear. <laughs> Children, they're not exempt. Children, when they get this disease, they look at their toy box or their Xbox and they run and say to mom or dad, what we really need is this. This disease has been known to cause all sorts of problems. People who have this disease are often inclined to compare their looks with the looks of other people. They're inclined to compare their children with other children. They're inclined sometimes to compare their spouses to other spouses. One expert suggests this disease is the root of many divorces today and much of the consumer debt. In fact, many people who have this disease tend to have at least one credit card that's maxed out, maybe two, maybe three. And so it's very important if you have this disease that you make sure uh, that you don't ever go over to a friend's house, especially if they have new granite countertops, and you don't have those, all right? You mustn't go over there. Or, especially if they have iron spindles on their staircase, and you don't. And you ought never go over to a friend's house if they have a pool, and you don't. Or if they have a pool and a spa, and you only have a pool. Or if they have a pool and a spa and an outdoor kitchen, and you only have a pool and a spa, you mustn't ever go to your friend's house. It's a dreadful thing, this disease. In a word, it's called discontentment, the disease of discontentment. And it's running at epidemic proportions here in our country. Even with all the advantages, even with all the privileges, even with all the blessings that we in the West have, we are the most discontented people, they say, who've ever been on this planet anytime, anywhere. People every day are frantically trying to numb the pain of this disease. They use alcohol, they use drugs, they use pornography, they use food. All these different ways that they're trying to treat this inner discontentment that they're feeling deep inside their soul. So, what is the cure? What's the secret to finding contentment in our lives? That's what we're going to talk about today. But if you go back and you see the writings of the old Stoics like Epictetus, and even Buddhism says, well, the cure is this. It comes from within. That's the cure. You have to train yourself to either, you, you have to be mindless or mindful, depending on whichever one you're ascribing to, to the end that you eliminate all of your emotions. You gotta eliminate all your desires. You gotta grow indifferent to your feelings. Even to the point that a loved one can die right beside you and you don't feel anything. That's how you break this thing called discontentment. I hear that and I say, that is terrible. If that's the only solution, that is hopeless and discouraging. The Apostle Paul in Philippians is going to say, Man, no, that's not it. That's not the cure. <laughs> the cure is actually a lot more hopeful, a lot better than that. But it's counterintuitive, he says. It's sort of like a secret. Now, before we read what, we, what he says, let's remember what the context is of this letter. You remember 
um, Epaphroditus has brought a love offering from the Christians there in Philippi. Um, and he's brought that love offering to Paul, who is imprisoned. He needs that love offering because he wasn't in the worst of prisons. He was under house arrest. But that meant that he had to pay his rent. And if he couldn't pay his rent, then they would put him in one of those kind of prisons where he does spend some time. <clears throat> Not this run through, but, but at other times of his life. And so he gets this love offering from the Philippians and he sends back this letter to Philippi. So among other things, it's a thank you note. It's a thank you note saying, hey, thank you so much for remembering. Thank you for sending that love offering to me. That was so awesome that you did that for me. And I really want you to know I appreciate it. But at the same time he's thanking them, Paul is also making sure not to waste the opportunity to teach them something. So he, he's, he's going to say, I don't want you to think, though, that the money that you sent me is what is making me feel okay. Okay? Because even if the gift that you sent had never gotten here, I'd still be okay. Even here under house arrest, even if they moved me to the worst of prisons, I'd still be okay because I've learned how to be okay, even if everything around me isn't okay. I've learned the secret to contentment, and I want you to know it as well. Now, with that context, let's read what he says, starting in verse 10 of chapter 4. He writes, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you'd always been concerned, but you'd had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him. Jesus Christ, who gives me the strength. Now, in the next few minutes, I want us to capture three realizations from this text, because I'm telling you, it would change your life if you can get these. And so if you're a note taker, here's the first one. The first thing he's telling us is being content is something we have to learn. It's not intuitive. We have to learn this. He said that in 12b, right? I have learned the secret of being content. That word learn means to be initiated into. In other words, if you ever got initiated into something, maybe you joined a club or fraternity, a sorority, you had to probably go through some sort of initiation process, right? Where they were training you and they were teaching you, this is the way that we do it. This is our history. This is how we think. Uh, if you're gonna be part of our group, this is kind of what you have to know. Paul's saying the very same sort of thing here to us. He's saying, now, <clears throat> If you're going to follow after Christ, you have to be initiated to know how the Christian approaches contentment. You're going to have to learn this. And the problem is that while we're trying to be initiated into Christianity, those of us who have said, I want to follow after Jesus, while we're trying to learn how to think Christianly, the world is perpetually coming after us, trying to train us trying to initiate us into how to think in a worldly sort of way. So we have these two competing tutors or mentors in, in our lives trying to initiate us. One study suggests that in today's uh, world, at least this part of the world where we are, uh, you are bombarded with as many as 3,500 ads a day. Now, at first I thought that is not even possible. Um, but then the other morning I was driving down 1960. And even as I was driving down 1960, I just began to inventory all the signs, all the billboards, all of the restaurants saying, come in and eat our food. It's the best food. And, and all the stores, some of which saying, come in, we're having a sale, we're running a special. And by the time I got to the end of 1960, I thought, 
I bet there were about a thousand things that my brain and my eyes just took in. And then I walked into Costco. And there's the other 2,500 right there. You walk in, and I mean, pow, pow, pow. You just, you don't have to go anywhere. And there's at least 2,500 things calling out saying, you need me. How did you ever get through life without me? Buy one of me. That's how come if I go to Costco, if I'm not careful, I went in to buy one thing, maybe two, 20 bucks, you know, and I walk out and I have this cart full of things and it's $250. And we're bombarded with the world's way of thinking. Um, so uh, not very long ago, I needed to get a cheap uh, phone uh, for our younger son just so that he could call and tell us, you know, here's where I am, pick me up or, you know, whatever. And so I figured uh, when I went to the cell phone shop, I'd spend about a hundred bucks and just get something quick and little and I'd walk out of there in about 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, you've done this too, eh? So the guy who helped me, he was so enthusiastic. He was so friendly. He was so visionary. And he, he began to, to cast this vision for me. And he said, no, 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 here's, here's really what you need to do. If you took your phone and your wife's phone and you passed them down to both of the boys, I could take your older son's phone that's pretty old anyhow. I can give you 100 bucks for that. And then they would both still have these phones that are really good. We'll repurpose them right here. And <clears throat> then I can put you and your wife in new iPhone 7s. And I was like, that just makes so much sense. You know, it, it just feels symmetrical, you know, and... and that's what I came in here meaning to do. Two and a half hours later, I walked out with two new iPhones and two repurposed iPhones, and I'd spent five or six or seven times as much as I had planned on spending, and yet I felt really rather good about it. <laughs> Until the iPhone 8 came out. <laughs> At which point I'm like, oh, Paul. I, I need to learn the secret. I don't know the secret. Teach me, Paul. Teach me. What's the secret? Obviously, I don't have it. What is wrong with me? Well, you and I have to realize the key to our contentment is found not where we most expect it. That would be in the external trappings that our world is always offering to us. The second thing you want to know from this text, we have to know from this text, is that real contentment has nothing to do with our external circumstances. It has nothing to do with our external situations. And this is why the Apostle Paul could say in verse 12b, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. You should underline any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in what. Paul is saying, don't take the bait. The best trappings of this life, they're only a mirage. You know what a mirage is. Like if you're driving over a highway, especially out in West Texas in the summer and the heat is just barreling down or up off the pavement and the, and the mirage, I don't know, you scientists could explain it better, but I think it has something to do with the light waves that are coming down and hitting the heat waves and, and the rays of light. And so it looks, when you're, when you're out there, it looks like there's this oasis of water. And I remember my dad, dad used to always do that little trick on me and then he'd go bam and it would move you know and and Paul's saying the trappings of this world they're like a mirage you have to realize that it's not really there several years ago when United Airlines uh, unveiled their new 787 Dreamliners I had to fly to a meeting in another city and so I was checking in, and the man who was checking me in said, hey, by the way, you know, you're going to be on one of the new Dreamliners, and we're offering very cheap upgrades to first class. Would you be interested? I said, well, yeah, how much? And he said, 20 bucks. I was like, 20 bucks, no points? That just bam, like, yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Let me tell you, it was something else. If you haven't sat up there, <laughs> it, it it is like your own bedroom, and you, the, the seat goes all the way down flat. Even for a tall guy like me, I'm like, look at me. I am all the way down. And there's this nice little barricade, so that guy over there, you get out of my, you know, I have my own little space, and I was like, this is great. 
and, and, they, and they bring the hot towels, you know, they just feel so good. And, and then they bring, <laughs> you know, the warm uh, hot towels. And then they bring the, the, the cloth napkins. And then they serve like really f- good food. And it was just, I was just enjoying this experience so much. The only thing I, I was regretting is that it was 10 in the morning and I couldn't go to sleep, you know, because I really wished. It, it, well, after a while of that, I, I needed to go to the bathroom. So I got up and went back to the galley. And um, as I was going to the bathroom, I, uh, I looked back in the back of the plane and I saw those destitutes. <laughs> <laughs> All those peasants. And then it hit me. Wait a second, on the return flight... Things will return to normal, and I'm going to be back there sitting with the likes of you. And when that happened, I could hardly enjoy the rest of my flight, which is exactly what Wallace Stevens points out. He says, whatever it is that's making you content, the only way that you can stay content with that thing is to tell yourself this thing is going to go on forever. Because the moment the realization hits you, This is not going to last forever. It's like a dagger to the heart. What's happening? All the things, all the people that you love the most, they're just triggering inside of you a desire for something that's bigger, something that's grander, something that's impossible to find, to define, something that's that's out there that would never end. The reason Paul says it's, it's kind of like a secret. It's because we can't get it until we realize what we're really looking for lies beyond the mirage of anything we've ever had or enjoyed or wanted. Robert J. Hastings wrote a, wrote a short essay some years ago describing this. He says, tucked away in the subconscious of our minds is an idyllic vision. We see ourselves on a long, long trip that almost spans the continent. We're traveling by passenger train, and out the windows are children waving and cattle grazing and rolling hillsides and city skylines. But you can't really notice those things because you're absolutely focused on getting to the station. In your mind, you've decided that the station is the place where you're really going to find fulfillment and satisfaction and happiness. And so you pace up and down the aisles of the train looking at your watch, wishing that the train could just go faster because if you could finally get to that station, then everybody would be good. He writes, the station is only a dream. It constantly outdistances us. And yet we cry, when I finally get to that station, that'll be it. When I'm 18, or when I get my degree, or when I can buy the new car, or when I can lose the weight, or when I can find Mr. or Miss Wright, when I can get married, when I've put the last kid through college, when I've paid off the mortgage, when I have enough to retire, that'll be it. And then I'll be happy. But somehow, he says, the station keeps moving back on you and hiding itself at the end of an endless track. The train is called Moore, and it's always headed to a station called Contentment. But it never quite gets there because contentment isn't found in the externals. Paul's telling us contentment, it's not an external job, it's an internal job. And the job is yours, and the job is mine. Which leads to the third thing he's gonna tell us in this text. The secret to contentment is internal, found not in what you have, but in whom you're with. Specifically, are you with Jesus. That's what it all comes down to. Throughout Philippians, what's he been saying over and over? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Gospel, gospel, gospel. Good news, good news, news. Jesus, Jesus. Throughout Philippians, he just keeps going back to it. And he gets to this interesting place here towards the end. And he's trying to help us realize in today's passage, your contentment, my contentment, it will never be related to the externals. He's saying, trust me. I I know what it's like to have plenty. And you can read into that 
something that you don't read literally, but you know it's what he was thinking. He was like, I grew up in a home of plenty. I had the finest education that money could buy. I sat at the feet of Gamaliel himself. I lived the life of privilege. That's the life I was born with. And yet, it didn't ever make me content. Not on the inside, it didn't. It wasn't well with my soul. So then one day I met Christ. And he transformed my life and I sought to follow him. And after following him, I've gotten beaten up. I've been imprisoned. I've been mocked and stripped and whipped and near drowned and often homeless. So I know what it's like to have nothing because I've lived on that extreme as well. And you know what I've learned? Having nothing doesn't make me discontent. Which we read and scratch our head and say, wait, so if plenty doesn't make you content and Nothing doesn't make you discontent. What are you saying, Paul? Paul's saying, I figured out a greater secret. It's unrelated to anything on the outside. It has everything to do with who you're with. On the inside, do you have Jesus on the inside? How could Paul stay um, content? Because he was tethered to Jesus. And that's why he says in verse 13, I can do all this through him who gives me the strength. He's saying, look, if you have Jesus, you have all that you'll ever need. So there's an apocryphal story that's written about a wealthy merchant during Paul's day who had heard about the apostle and he became so fascinated with the apostle Paul's life that he arranged with... um, Paul's pupil, uh, Timothy, to be able to have a visit with him in his imprisoned state when he was passing through Rome. And that visit was arranged, and when he got there and he stepped inside and he met the Apostle Paul, he was surprised to find the Apostle Paul looked indeed rather old and physically frail. But he felt at once the strength and the peace and the magnetism of this man who relied on Jesus as his all in all. And they talked for some time and finally the merchant left. And as the story has it, sometime later he connected with Timothy and he said, I've never seen anything like it. But what's the secret of that man's power? And Timothy said to the merchant, did you not figure it out? Paul is in love. In love, yes! Paul's in love with the savior Jesus, to which the merchant said, is that all? To which Timothy said, that, sir, is everything. Paul's secret to contentment that we, it was that he was so fully concentrated in Christ that it didn't matter whether he was abased or whether he was abounding. He was in Christ, and Christ was in him, the hope of glory. And, and so he was fine, and he knew, I, I've got all that I need. Jesus told us the same thing. You remember back in Matthew 6? He said, why do you worry about this? and Why do you run after that and all those sorts of things? If you would just seek me, if you just seek my kingdom, then I, I'll throw in all of the other sorts of things. I'll provide for your needs, but come after me. Me first and foremost. C.S. Lewis wrote, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. But aim at earth and you'll end up getting neither. Somewhere along the way, you and I, we have to come into awareness. We have to come into this secret that Paul was trying to help us to understand that lasting contentment and happiness, they'll never be discovered through the externals, but only through pursuing Jesus, Jesus, Amen. Jesus. Yes. It's sort of like this. If you take a, um, a cup with water, and then you put in a bag of tea, It doesn't take long before you begin to see the transformation that's happening. 
This is precisely what Jesus wants to do in our life. He says, I want to come into your life and I want to transform you. I want to change you uh, so that you'll never be the same again. You'll be an altogether different. See, this cup of water will never just be water again. Why? Because it's been changed into tea. It will never just take like, taste like water again because it's been transformed. But I'll tell you the problem with many of our lives. They don't look like this. Many of our lives, even those of us who've trusted in Jesus, our lives look more like this. What's going on here? Well, there's a lot more water. And the water in the illustration represents the world. There's just so much more stuff coming after us that it's not that we don't have Jesus. No, he's, he's in there. It's just that we've got so much other stuff that's in there as well. It's just not able to make so much of an impact. And this is why I'm convinced that there are so many people who name the name of Christ and yet they cannot figure out why am I not feeling this joy and this contentment and this peace and all of these sorts of things that, that I hear Christians talk about. I don't feel any of that. I just feel flat and bland, nothing. Well, I think the problem might very well be you just have so much world that's coming at you. So what's the solution? I'll tell you what the solution could be. You could just take your Jesus and just say, you know what? I'm just going to move away to a monastery and, <laughs> or to an Amish community. And there I won't be diluted by any of the world's uh, problems. Well, that is kind of one way to do it, but I doubt that any of you are going to sign up for that one. So what else you got? Well, here's the deal. Since we do live in this world that is coming at us with so much stuff, we're going to have to do something different. And you have people like Jen Hatmaker who came up with a seven experiment and, and, you know, why don't you give up this or why don't you do without that or go without this in 30 days, 40 days, 50 days, turn off the phone, all these sorts of things. Well, that's marvelous. But I need something that's more than a 30 or 40 or 50 day experiment. I need something that's going to sustain my soul for the rest of my life that's going to anchor me in and give me a, a sense of contentment that Christ said is yours for the taking. You know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to throw more of Jesus at this life that you're living. See, there's a lot of people trying to sustain their souls on like one time a month of church. They're like, I just can't figure out. I go to church regularly. I just can't figure out why things aren't getting lit on fire. Well, I think it's because... You're about 100 parts water and one part tea. You're going to have to throw more at this if you're really going to see something begin to be transformed, if you're going to experience this, this contentment that Paul was talking about. But look, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You already know this. Intuitively, you know this. Any number of you have told me this. Hundreds of you come back every year. You come back from short-term mission trips. You go on the road and other things, and you've been gone for a week or so, and you come back, and someone asks you, how was your mission trip? And your lip starts to quiver, and this tear comes out of your eye and you're like, oh my gosh. You just wouldn't even understand. No, really, I've been to. I, I would understand. Give it a go. Yeah, it's just like, <laughs> I just felt so close to God. It's just like, none of the things that I always think about, I didn't, I, I, in fact, I thought, man, what a spoiled brat I am back home. And I looked at what all these people have and the team, we just, we would pray together and we would go out and we would serve and I just felt close to Jesus. Yes, you were. You were more concentrated for that week. You weren't experiencing a dream. You were experiencing reality. The problem is you came home to the dream and you can't figure out why does the dream feel like the nightmare? I really liked that better. You've experienced this even if you've never gone on that kind of trip. Maybe you've served just locally. And you go to one of our Title I schools and you serve some of the underprivileged uh, uh, people that we work with. Or maybe you've gone and visited somebody in the, in the prisons, like I talked about a few weeks ago. And, and some of you do that kind of ministry. Or maybe you've gone and you've visited people in the hospital. People like Jesus talked about in Matthew 25, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And you leave every time and you're like, what just happened? I felt something. What you felt is you were more concentrated in Christ the way you were meant to be all along. You weren't diluted in those hours. 
You've, you've had this experience even in your devotional time. Some of you uh, say, you know, I had this great time with the Lord and I was reading and here's what he told me in his word and in my prayer time and I just, I just felt this peace and it, it, was just, it was just amazing. Yes, you were more concentrated in Christ. You weren't diluted. Don't you see, it, there is uh, any number of you, I bet even this past week, you went to a grow group. I've heard this so many times over the years. Person says, you know, I almost didn't go to grow group tonight because I'm just so busy. But if I hadn't gone, oh, what I would have missed. The fellowship, the Bible study, the prayer time, the laughter, the tears, the joy, the peace, the, just that for maybe two hours, everything was right with the world. I'm so glad I didn't miss. That's the way he always meant it to be. The problem with our lives friends, is that this part of the world, we're so diluted. And diluted equals discontent. So we have to throw more at it to counteract all that the world is throwing at it. We have to prioritize. We have to change some things around and say, you know what, I've got to go for more of Jesus because there's just so much of the world coming after me. Even this past week when I was preparing the message, I, I, was think, I, I was just thinking of this word picture that had sort of come to my mind. And even as I was preparing, I had these moments where I was just like, oh, this is going to be a good message. I know it's going to be a good message. It's already been a good message in my soul. But then an hour or two later, I'm driving down 1960, and I'm seeing all the, you know, and I'm thinking, you know what, I probably should buy one of those, you know. And, and you know, or why can't my kids be more like his kids? Or, you know, you know these sorts of things start to happen. And I just have started mechanically saying, that's your trigger right there. You need more of Jesus. You just go back to Jesus. You need more of Jesus. You don't need more of that. You need more of Jesus. And this is what Paul was saying. You have to learn. This is an initiation. It's a process of learning how to go after more of Jesus. When I think of going after Jesus, I think of my friend Art Fleeser. And I'll close with this. I met Art when I was in seminary, uh, right around 1990. And Art, um, he was a retired professor in Wilmore, Kentucky of Asbury. He he had taught speech. And we met uh, serving in the homeless kitchen, downtown Lexington, Kentucky. And we just got talking and, and had a good time, and I liked him, and he liked me, and, and so we drove together a time or two doing that, and, and we just developed this friendship, notwithstanding our, I don't know, 40, 45-year, maybe 50 uh, age difference. And <clears throat> for the rest of my seminary years, many times on a Friday night, when several of us who were young and single in our 20s, and we didn't have much to do but maybe to go into town and have some, some good food at a nice restaurant, we'd call up Art and say, hey, you want to go? Yeah, I'd love to. So he'd go along with us, and we developed this friendship. Well, over the years, um, I learned that uh, all about his family. His wife had died of cancer. He loved her so much, had pictures of her in his home all around. And his daughters had grown up, and they were all launched. And so he lived by himself. Um, And when I graduated, uh, we continued to stay in touch. And periodically, if I had to go back to the seminary for a meeting or, or, or something, he was always so eager to say, oh, come stay here. Stay in one of the bedrooms. I'll cook for you. And he would cook the best food. It wasn't the healthiest, but boy, it was yummy. He would cook for me um, in the evening times. Uh, before I'd go off in the day for my meetings. And we would talk, and, and he'd ask, how's the church? He'd want to know what's going on here at the church. And, and then he'd want to know, especially after God brought Suzanne in my life, about Suzanne and the boys. And he was always wanting to, to find out what's going on. At the end of our meals, he had a little upright piano that just sat up against the wall. I don't think it had been tuned in years. Horrible out of tune. But he knowing that I can play. He said, now I want you to just go over and just play some, 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 some hymns and start with Amazing Grace or How Great Thou Art. Or, you know, one of the, and so I'd go over and I'd start playing and I'd look over at the sofa and Art was just sitting in the sofa just singing out his praises. Well, um, through the years, he decided he would sell that house and downscale, he moved to a retirement village and um, 
he got a smaller unit, so he only had one bedroom and one common room, but he was able to keep his little piano. I said, Art, do you, you oh yes, I, I'm not very good. And he went over and plunked out of me. I'm like, okay. He said, but, but it's enough that I can sit down and I can sing my praises to the Lord every day. And <clears throat> so he kept his, his piano, which came to represent, sort of symbolize Jesus <laughs> to me, the way he just always wanted to have that piano. And uh, so he could sing out his praises to the Lord. Well, I got a, uh, an email from him, or actually a, a snail mail from him right after Hurricane Harvey. And he, uh, he sent a note saying, so grateful that you uh, came through the flood fine, that you're safe. We'll keep praying. And he enclosed a check for $100 to our Harvey Fund. This is a man who doesn't have a whole lot. And then six weeks ago, now age 94, he wrote me his, his final email. He says, I've continued to have falls. I'm falling so often, so far, without extreme harm that I've decided to move to the personal care unit as one just became available here at the village. So I'm going to be unable to take everything with me to my new room due to its smaller size. Therefore, I'm going to give up my desk and my computer, which means email. Since I won't have email after January 26, now you can use my U.S. mail address below. He says, but I can keep my piano. He said, I've not forgotten you, and I pray for you, trust you in God's care and keeping. He signed off saying, he's caring for me, and I have so much for which to give thanks. Love, Art. <laughs> just kind of sat there thinking about that note, thinking, wow, he just gave up his desk, his computer, his email, but he still has his piano which is kind of like Jesus to him because it's how he accesses praising the Lord as he plunks out his, his little songs, his hymns, and sings out to Jesus. At this stage, Art doesn't have much more, but at this stage, if he were standing here, he would say, I don't need much more. I have everything that I need. I have Jesus Jesus, Jesus, he's been with me this long and he'll be with me until the day he sees fit to bring me home. Paul's telling us the secret to commitment is found not in what you have, but in whom you're with. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. If Jesus was enough, for the Apostle Paul. And Jesus is enough for my friend, Art. It dawned on me, Jesus must be enough for me as well. Just give me Jesus. He's all I need. And he's all you need as well. Why don't we talk to him right now? Lord, thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for um, how when he was stripped down to near nothing and plenty appreciative for the financial gift, he was quick to tell us, it's not the gift that's making me content. It's not the gift that's making me okay. It's not the fact that I can stay in this home prison house arrest rather than going into the dungeon because even if I had to go to the dungeon I'd be okay because I've learned how to be okay even when everything around me is not okay I'm okay as long as I have Jesus just give me Jesus Lord I pray that you might continue to teach me that and all of us here that that you teach us how to refocus 
not just once a day, but many times a day, to reconcentrate ourselves in you, Christ Jesus, and to see in that reconcentrating a recalibration of contentment. Forgive us, Lord, for how diluted our lives so often are. And for the way that then we just shrug our shoulders as if to say, I don't, I just guess the Lord's not coming through for me like he comes through for the other people. But instead of realizing maybe it's that we're just not throwing enough of ourselves at you, but we're so diluted. Help us, Lord, to be concentrated in you, Jesus. My prayer, Lord, is that any person who's here who, who'd never said yes to you in the first place, even today, would say yes. Yes to the reality that you came to this world. Yes to the reality that you lived a life of sinless perfection. Yes to the reality that you died the death of punishment all of us deserved. Yes to the reality that you rose and you conquered the grave on the third day and that you'll conquer death in our lives and that you'll give us life as well if we would but tether ourselves to you. If you're here and you've never trusted in him, even now I just invite you, put your trust in Jesus. Give your heart and soul to him right now. And for the rest of us who you say, I've done that, I did that years and years ago. Maybe today is the day for us to leave here with a new picture in our mind. I've got to prioritize this if I have any hope of staying concentrated in Christ and enjoying the contentment that follows. I pray, God, that you'd help any number of us to reprioritize even our schedules, our calendars, that you'd work even in us in the coming days. We pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.